There's not a decent mother in the world that hasn't realized that. I'm serious, Maddie. She smiled and sipped her coffee. So am I. So how does a person make a decision that important? Whether or not they're going to do it. Most people don't decide. They just don't have any choice. I've heard you say yourself that you think the reason most people have kids is because they get pregnant. I stared at the coffee grounds that made a ring in the bottom of the white mug. Back in Pittman, I heard of a fairly well-to-do woman who made her fortune reading tea leaves and chicken bones, which she kept in a bag and would scatter across her kitchen floor like jacks. On the basis of leaves and bones, she would advise people on what to do with their lives. No wonder she was rich. It seems like almost anything is better than having only yourself to blame when you screw things up. Taylor, honey, if you don't mind my saying so, I think you're asking the wrong question. How do you mean? You're asking yourself, can I give this child the best possible upbringing and keep her out of harm's way her whole life long? The answer is no, you can't, but nobody else can either. Not a state home, that's for sure. For heaven's sake, the best they can do is turn their heads while the kids learn to pick locks and snort hooch and then try to keep them out of jail. Nobody can protect a child from the world. That's why it's the wrong thing to ask if you're really trying to make a decision. So what's the right thing to ask? Do I want to try? Do I think it would be interesting, maybe even enjoyable in the long run, to share my life with this kid and give her my best effort and maybe when all said and done, end up with a good friend. I don't think the state of Arizona is looking at, at it that way. I guarantee you they're not. It occurred to me to wonder whether Maddie had ever raised kids of her own, but I was afraid to ask. Lately, whenever I'd scratch somebody's surface, I'd turned up a ghost story. I made up my mind not to bring it up. I called for an appointment to meet with Cynthia alone, without Turtle. In past appointments, she had talked about legal claim and state homes and so forth in Turtle's presence. Granted, Turtle had been occupied with a new selection of toys offered by the Department of Economic Security, but in my experience, she usually got the drift of what was going on, whether or not she appeared to be paying attention. If either I or the state of Arizona was going to instill in this child a sense of security, discussing her future and ownership as though she were an item of commerce wasn't the way to do it. The more I thought about this, the madder I got, but that wasn't what I intended to discuss with Cynthia. The appointment was on a Friday afternoon. I started to lose my nerve again when I saw her in her office, her eyes made up with pale green shadows and her hair pulled back in a gold barrette. I don't believe Cynthia was much older than I was, but you put somebody in high-heeled pumps and sit her behind a big desk and age is no longer an issue. She is more important than you are, period. Proof of abandonment is very, very difficult, she was explaining to me. In this case, probably impossible. But you're right, there are legal alternatives. The cornerstone of an adoption of this type would have to be the written consent of the child's natural parents, and you would need to be named in the document. What if there are no natural parents, if they were, were to be dead, for instance? Then it would have to come from the nearest living relative the person who would normally have custody, and a death certificate would have to be presented as well. But the most important thing, as I said, is that the document would name you, specifically as the new guardian. <clears throat> what kind of document exactly? The law varies. In some states, the mother would have to acknowledge her consent before a judge or a representative of the Department of Economic Security. In others, a simple written statement notarized and signed before witnesses is sufficient. What about on an Indian reservation? Do you know that sometimes on Indian reservations, they don't give birth or death certificates? Cynthia wasn't the type that liked to be told anything. I'm aware of that, she said. In certain cases, exceptions are made. Cynthia's office was tiny, really, and her desk wasn't actually all that big. She didn't even have a window in there. Don't you miss knowing what the weather's like, I asked her. I beg your pardon? You don't have a window. I just wondered if you ever kind of lost touch with what was going on outside, being cooped up in here all day with the air conditioning and the fluorescent lighting. It was the first time in my life I'd ever said anything like fluorescent lighting out loud. As you recall, I came to your house on the evening that you're that April was assaulted. 
Cynthia always called Turtle by her more conventional name. I do my share of field work, she said. Of course. Have I answered your questions, Taylor? Mostly, not completely. I'd like to know how a person would go about finding the information you mentioned about the laws in different states, like Oklahoma, for instance. I can look that up and get back to you. If you like, I can get you the name of someone in Oklahoma City who could help you formalize the papers. This took me by surprise. You'd be willing to help me out? Certainly. I'm on your side here, Taylor. She leaned forward and folded her hands on her desk blotter, and I noticed that her fingernails were in bad shape. It's possible that Cynthia was a nail biter. Are you saying that you'd rather see Turtle stay with me than go into a state home? There has never been any doubt in my mind about that. I stood up, walked around the chair, and sat down again. Excuse my French, but why in the hell didn't you say so before now? She blinked her gold coin eyes. I thought that ought to be your decision. At the end of my hour, I was halfway out the door, but then stopped and came back, closing the door behind me. Thank you, I said. You're welcome. Can I ask you a kind of personal question? It's about the cameo brooch. Um, brooch, excuse me. She looked amused. You can ask, she said. Do you have to shop at the Salvation Army? I mean, is it because of your pay or do you just like rummaging through other people's family heirlooms? I'm a trained therapist, Cynthia said, smiling. I don't answer questions like that. Out in the lobby, I stopped to chat with one of the secretaries who asked me, who asked where my little girl was today. The secretary's name was Jewel. I had spoken with her several times before. She had a son with dyslexia, which she explained was a disease that caused people to see things backwards. Like the American flag, for instance, she said. The way he would see it would be that the stars are up in the right-hand corner instead of the left. But then there's other things where it doesn't matter. Like you take the word wow, for instance. That's his favorite word. He writes it all over everything and the word mom too. Before he had gotten around to leave the building, another secretary came hustling over and handed me a note, which she said was from Cynthia. It said, I appreciate your sensitivity and not wishing to discuss April's custody and her presence. I'm sorry if I have been careless. There was also a name, Mr. Jonas Wilford Armistead, along with an Oklahoma City address and underneath the words, good luck. All evening after I'd fed the kids and put them to bed, I paced the house. I couldn't wait for Luann to get home. But then when she did, I wasn't sure I wanted to tell her anything yet. I hadn't completely made up my mind. For heaven's sake, Luann said, you're making me nervous. Either sit down or wash the dishes. I washed the dishes. Whatever's on your mind, I hope you get it settled, she said, and went to the living room to read. She had been reading a novel called Daughter of the Cheyenne Winds, which she claimed she had found in her locker at Red Hot Mamas and had nothing whatever to do with Inhale being on the Montana-Colorado circuit. I followed her into the living room. You're not mad, are you? Because I don't want to talk about it. Nope. I'll tell you tomorrow. I just have to think some more. She didn't look up. Go think, she said. Think and wash the dishes. I didn't sleep at all that night. I was getting used to it. I watched Turtle roll from her side to her stomach and back again. Her eyes rolled back and forth under her eyelids, and sometimes her mouth worked too. Whoever she was talking to in her dream, she told them a whole lot more than she ever told me. I would have paid good money to be in that dream. In the morning, I left her asleep and went to Maddie's to finish an alignment and front and front and rear rotation I'd left undone, undone the previous afternoon. The guy was coming in sometime that day to pick it up. I didn't look at a clock, but it must have been early when I went in because I was already finished and ready to go home before Maddie came downstairs. I hung around a while longer, making coffee and dusting the shelves and changing the calendar. It was still on May and this was August. I stared for a long time at the picture of the Aztec man carrying the passed out woman, thinking about whatever Latin American tragedy it stood for, thinking naturally of Esperanza and Estevan, though I knew that more often than not, it was the other way around. The woman carried the man through the tragedy, the man and the grandma and the man and the grandma and all the kids. Finally, Maddie came down. We had a cup of coffee and we talked. Afterward, I found Luann and the kids in the park. 
Turtle was amusing herself by sweeping a patch of dirt with an old hairbrush, presumably Edna since it was red, and Luann had momentarily put aside Daughter of the Cheyenne Winds to engage in a contest of will with Dwayne Ray. Luann was bound to win, of course. I said no. Give it to me right now. Where'd you get that from? She grabbed his fist, which was headed on an automatic pilot course for his mouth, and extracted a dirt-covered purple jelly bean. Where in the heck do you think he got that? My God, Taylor, just imagine if he'd eaten it. Dwayne Ray's mouth remained in the shape of an O for several seconds, still expecting the intercepted jelly bean, and then he started to scream. I used to know this old farm woman that said, you've got to eat a peck of dirt before you die, I said. Luann picked up Dwayne Ray and bounced him. Well, maybe if you don't eat a peck of dirt before your first birthday, then you won't die so quick, is what I say. I sat down on the bench. Listen, I've made up my mind about something. I'm going to drive Esperanza and Estevan to a safe house in Oklahoma. And while I'm there, I'm going to see if I can find any of Turtle rel- Turtle's relatives. She stared at me. Dwayne Ray came down on her knee with a bump and was stunned into being quiet. What for? So they can sign her over to me. Well, what if they won't? What if they see how good she's turning out and decide they want her back? I don't think they will. But what if they do? Damn it, Luann, you've been telling me till you were blue in the face to do something. Take action. Think positive. Blah, blah, blah. I'm trying to think positive here. Sorry. What other choice have I got than to go? If I just sit here on my hands, then they take her. I know, you're right. If her relatives want her back, then I'll think of something. We'll cut that fence when we come to it. What if you can't find them? Sorry. I'll find them. 